Brain Intelligence Communication and Consciousness、uh, Lecture, BX Lecture at the University of Tokyo 2022,、uh, Lecture 3, Memory, Spectrum, and Time. So,、uh, the s u b m e r s syndrome is a rare but extraordinary condition、uh, in which、uh, people have this island of genius ability.、Uh, only About one in 10 persons with autistic disorder have such remarkable abilities. And well, it's a spectrum of abilities, but it's always linked to massive memory. So, Rayman was a wonderful、uh, film which described how、uh, people with uh, southern uh, abilities would behave in a unique way. And this is the wonderful person who was the model of Rayman.、Uh, King Peak, who、uh, memorized 9,000 books without any hardships. And he literally remembered what were written in these books verbatim. And、uh, when scientists e- examined King Peak's、uh, brain, they found that、uh, from birth, King Peak's brain lacked corpus callosum. So the left hemisphere and right hemisphere were behaving. More or less independently. I had the you know, privilege to talk with Kim Peek in Salt Lake City in 2009 on the Japanese TV shooting, and I was so impressed by what I experienced you know, the sheer uniqueness of his presence and the love of from Peek, who was、uh, you know, Kim Peek's father. And you know, what from Peek is holding here is the Oscar statuette. That、uh, they received for、uh, the you know, best script、uh, prize in the Oscars. And you know, Kim Frumpy carried the Oscar statuette、uh, every time they went around in town. And it, it was a great explainer for people who noticed Kim Peek's unique behavior. So,、uh, Fran、uh, boasted at the time that it was probably the most held. Uh, Oscar statuette in the world、um, uh, by many, many people. So, this was a really wonderful experience. So, there are some people who are diagnosed with this condition, h e p a t h y s y m a g i a and it is、um, extraordinarily high superior、uh, autobiographical memory capacity. And this is really rare. And, you know, I had the fortune to you know, visit one of、uh, the people、uh, diagnosed with hyperthymagian, and he was Rick Byrne in Cleveland. I had a Japanese TV shooting, and he was an incredible man. And he had all these wonderful recollections of his own life. And this is a great insight into how human brains behave. And the first case、uh, reported of hyperthymagia was Jill Price. And Her life was made into this wonderful book, h y p a t h y m e s i c Syndrome, uh, you know,、um, explaining the woman who can't forget. And this is a uniquely brilliant、uh, glimpse into a really unique individual. And there's this paper who, which examined the capabilities of Jill Price and the Detailed,、uh, you know, exactness of the autobiographical memory from Jill Price's life is quite amazing. And it is also really、uh, inspirational to know that her, you know, general intelligence and executive function, all these things are about average. So this is truly an island of genius and which tells you how Su- uh, in- superbly、uh, individual、uh, brains can be. And, you know, episodic memory is not,、uh, you know, a、um, sole product of human brains.、Uh, there are episodic memory, episodic like memories in no human animals. And this is a well known example of sculpture, caching, and searching. These wonderful birds know where, what, and when、uh, they. Cached、uh, because it's very important to know that because、uh, sometimes they would cache a worm and they would cache a nut, and、uh, worms are p e r i s h a b l e so they、uh, need to be、uh, you know, searched and recovered and eaten as soon as possible. Whereas nuts, they can stay、uh, fresh for a long time, so they don't have to you know,、uh, search them in a hurry. So, this wonderful experiment、uh, exhibited the 
describe Jay's ability to、um, distinguish what they cashed, when they cashed, and where they cashed in a true、uh, ex- exhibition of episodic like memory. And this is a really brilliant work. And going back to autobiographical memory,、uh, this is another book, a、uh, really interesting book,、uh, examining the you know, life of an individual、uh, equipped with a hypothalamic memory. And this、uh, HK Dedeberry was really blessed with the love of Jim Bradford, who noticed this little kid、uh, you know, resting by the sh- window. And he was, uh, he, uh, Jim Bradford noticed how individual, unique individual this kid was. And he, you know, spent a lot of time with him. And they, together they wrote a really wonderful book. And、uh, this, this paper I examined HK's autobiographical hypermnesia、uh, abilities. And,、uh, you know, HK. I should say, mention、uh, suffered from retropathy or prematurity, ROP, and which resulted in complete brightness. And, but despite these difficulties, HKs、uh, exhibit a really wonderful autobiographical memory. However,、uh, HKs general intelligence and standard memory test performance were about average. So, this is again an island of genius phenomenon.、Uh, really superb autobiographical memory. On the top of a really average、uh, general intelligence. So, this would tell you、uh, something about the human brain.、Uh, we can be uniquely individual. And when the scientists、uh, examined HK's brain, they found that the right amygdala and, amygdala and hippocampus were significantly more strongly connected. So, this could explain、uh, HM's superb ability to remember. Uh, events from his own life,、uh, because in general it is known that emotion and memory are really closely coupled. And the center for emotion, amygdala, are so closely linked with many、uh, new circuits in the brain related to memory. And on top of that,、uh, amygdala can trigger the release of stress hormone by way of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal HPA axis. And that would t- Modify the process of memory consolidation, resulting in a stronger memory recall later. That could also backfire because, in the case of post traumatic stress disorder,、uh, which、um, you know, about 5% of men and 10% of women、uh, would develop、um, you know, PTSD, and on the top of、uh, lifetime experience of trauma exposure. At 50%. But you know, th- when this happens, of course, it can be、uh, a really、uh, serious problem for the people concerned. So it is very important to understand how the brain causes、uh, information and how the m- emotion and memory related areas interact with each other. And so when you, we talk about human brain,、uh, we you know, are, of course, interested in the memory capacity. And in computers, we have the Moore's law. And、uh, Moore's law states that the you know, complexity of the integrated circuit would roughly double every 18 months. And which has been going on for the last couple of decades, and which is a brilliant achievement of the computer industry. But there are discussions about、uh, how far we can go on this trend. And in this 2015 paper, Kumar、uh, put a really、uh, convincing argument for me. And he discussed the Compton wavelengths. And he, he, his prediction was that、uh, probably the、uh, Moore's law would stop scaling、uh, in 30 to 40 minutes、uh, when we would reach the limit. So it's anybody's guess, but、um, it is clear that、uh, the Advancement of computers cannot go on forever. So, given that physical limitation,、um, it is interesting to consider what would be the memory capacity of the human brain. Because、uh, apparently, within this really restricted space,、uh, a lot of memory can be stored. So, one of the evolutionary pressures、uh, on the human brain would have presumably have been、uh, how to increase memory. 
uh, in within this limited space. And there's this really interesting study about the synaptic uh, capacity, so to speak. And they did EM reconstruction of hippocampus uh, neurons, and they concluded that there would be a minimum of 26 distinguishable synaptic strength. That would correspond to about 4.7 bits of information uh, at each synapse. So that could be the kind of memory capacity that we would be talking about when we deal with human uh, brain. Um, you know, there have been really interesting discussions about the limits of human memory, uh, most notably from William James. And, you know, William James made some comments on the child prodigy, William Sedis, and that um, inspired Robert Thomas uh, to write a foreword to Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, in which he made this comment that Professor William James of Harvard used to say that the average man developed only 10% of his latent uh, mental ability, which led to that now famous, or should I say infamous, 10% of the brain myth. Now, this child prodigy, um, William, William Sidis, was a really interesting guy. Uh, he entered Harvard at age 11, and he could read the New York Times at 18 months, and by age eight, he had report. He taught himself eight languages. In addition to that, he invented this uh, unique language uh, of his own, Vendergood, and he, he wrote an unpublished manuscript, The Tribes of the States, United States, which uh, uh, kind of argued that uh, the democracy of the United States actually came from uh, the, an inspiration from the Native Americans. Uh, who lived there for peacefully for many, many years, and which might be true, actually, which would be a really beautiful story. And he also wrote The Animate and The Inanimate, 1925. Uh, probably, uh, you know, William Sidis was a man who was too talented to, to be truly successful, but he at least made some scratch uh, on the world history and this book, the uh, the animate and the inanimate, is available in Kindle edition, I think, uh, from Amazon. And uh, there's this, you know, rave review of that. And uh, this reviewer um, claims that it's even better than uh, Ray Kurzweil's conceptualization of singularity. You should really read this book if you're interested. But anyway, um, you know, so there are many approaches to the limits of human brain. And one of them is this by this really wonderful person, Alan Schneider, who is um, a friend of mine, uh, who is based in Sydney. And he believes that we can, you know, uh, tap into our, you know, hidden uh, ability as uh, savants by applying transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, uh, to our brain. Um, you know, this is him, uh, Alan Schneider, doing an experiment in his Sydney lab. And he's basically saying that uh, we have inherent savant like abilities, but because of uh, the dominance of top down uh, in inhibition, we cannot do that. So, in, in order to unleash our savant like abilities, we need to disinhibit the left hemisphere. Then, as uh, a right hemisphere would do, be able to do their job. And, you know, voila, you would have someone like Avitis. Uh, it's still debatable, um, you know, whether Alan Schneider's uh, approach would be successful, but it is certainly true that transcranial magnetic stimulation is being applied in limited circumstances uh, clinically. And this is a wonderful review paper uh, in which they discuss uh, the applicability of uh, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation, RTMS, to many different aspects of human disease. And uh, this paper claims that there are the high level of evidence of um, applicability in the case of depression, pain, motor stroke, and schizophrenia. Now, some people are uh, interested in augmenting human memory. And one of them is Elon Musk. And, you know, of course, you know Elon Musk. And in his really wonderful paper on Neuralink, uh, Elon Musk describes in really wonderful details uh, about how you can implant uh, multiple electrodes on the brain um, in a sh short period of time and make measurements of uh, 
thousands of neurons in principle and collect data so that you can understand uh, the functions of human uh, the brain and also uh, uh, in the future probably to augment human memory capacity. So this is how, certainly an interesting idea to pursue, I think, and coming from Elon Musk, uh, the expectations are high. Now, um, so we have this general conception that uh, greater memory capacity would lead to greater intelligence. And this is the kind of data that I am really interested in. Um, you know, apparently there's a positive correlation between working memory capacities and IQ. So, you know, this makes sense because the more you can, you know, keep in your brain at one period of time, uh, you know, as in terms of relevant information uh, related to a task, uh, the more um, intelligent you would be. Uh, so this, you know, fundamental relationship between working memory and IQ is quite interesting. Now, this is a slide that I have been using for the last couple of decades, uh, really, in my university lectures and so on. I love this idea that um, when episodic memory are encoded in the brain, they would go through years of editing processes so that a semantic memory can be formed in an effective way. So there is this ongoing long-term memory editing uh, processes in the brain, which is really central to the relation between memory and intelligence. And, you know, I, I, even creativity is would be related to uh, memory. Uh, this is Roger Penrose, uh, the Nobel laureate in physics. Uh, he is saying that create, creating is similar to remembering. And, you know, <laughs> I have a really um, impressive anecdote uh, about Roger Penrose. Uh, when I visited uh, Roger Penrose at, at Oxford, uh, he tried to enter an office, his office, and, you know, he was having this keychain with tens of keys and he was not sure which key would be for the door and so he was he started to look at the pattern of cuts on the key you know people typically would normally would uh, look at the heads key heads you know uh, to you know see the numbers of rooms and so on but in the case of Roger Penrose he just looked at the patterns cutting patterns of the keys and and then after a few seconds he recognized which was the correct pattern for the room and he opened the door presto and that was it so it, it is a really unique uh, memory capacity of Roger Penrose that I witnessed in Oxford anyway um you know as uh, Roger Penrose said that uh, probably creation Creating is similar to remembering because, you know, when you remember something uh, in the prefrontal cortex, there is this feeling of knowing, FOK. And if you have that, uh, you would try, your brain would try to retrieve information from the uh, temporal cortex. So, so, you know, there would be this movement from the temporal cortex to the prefrontal cortex and induced by FOK. And that's a similar process would be going on in creation because before you create something, you have a feeling of knowing of what to create, what to expect. And you try to make a really interesting connection between already stored memory within the temporal cortex. So the way uh, memory is retrieved from the uh, temporal cortex, uh, temporal associated cortex um, in recollection, is quite similar to the way you create something out of the archive of uh, data in your brain. So I think there's some link between creation and memory. Now, um, so this meta memory is between uh, specifically a feeling of knowing and the confidence uh, of what you have recollected are really important. And there are some interesting studies uh, studying the neural correlates of meta memory in terms of feeling of knowing and confidence of what you have recalled. So these would be very important uh, in elucidating the, not only the memory processes, but also the creative processes. Now, I know a lot of people are concerned about the relationship between memory and aging. Uh, as you would expect, the capacity for uh, episodic memory and semantic memory uh, would degrade over you know, age, but you know, the way semantic memory uh, peaks and then degrades, it's much slower than episodic memory, which can be, you know, uh, really uh, 
you know, sensible because you know s semantic memory after all uh, arises only as a pro as a result of editing of episodic memory. So you know this is something to be considered that about. But you know it's quite interesting to see this really wide range of individual differences in memory aging because you know our younger people of course have a high cognitive performance but you know uh, when you age in the 70s and 80s some people do retain really high uh, cognitive abilities and some people do de decline so but there are these really indiv uh, huge individual differences and also in terms of psychopampal volume and coded volume and prefrontal white water volume uh, you know there are so many individual differences and uh, some elder people retain uh, the same uh, degree of volumes uh, hippocampal coded and profrontal as young people so the same is true for the up regulation in the DAPFC activity in the prefrontal cortex uh, some older people uh, do retain the same amount of up regulation in working memory related DLPFC activity as young young adults. So you know these individual differences are really important. Now some people train their memory capacity as professionals. Uh, you know the so-called World Memory Championship is really interesting. It uh, lists many different disciplines, and the last discipline is speed cars. And here's the world's memory champion. tries to remember the sequence uh, randomly So this is speed these are really wonderful people. And actually I met with a former world memory champion in the UK for a Japanese TV shooting, Ben Pridmore. And he was a really wonderful person. So Ben Pridmore told me how he trained to be world memory champion. So you know he so some people can train. Of course, they would have uh, really wonderful talents, but on top of that, they can train themselves into being a world memory champion, and that is great. And some people are, you know, super memory heroes by birth. Uh, this is a really famous st study by the Russian physiologist uh, Er Rulia. And Rulia studies a man called S, and, you know, S had a naturally great capacity for memory. He was a S was a journalist and never took notes, and but yet he reproduced all the details of an interview, and S also had a condition known as synesthesia. So some people argue that this um, uh, unique uh, sensory uh, trait of synesthesia probably have something to do with um, great memory capacity. So now synesthesia is the condition that some people uh, associate naturally uh, numbers and uh, alphabets and so on with certain colors, for example. So, for example, when you see uh, number four, uh, uh, people with synesthesia might uh, perceive the color green, for example. And the assumption, usually assumption, is that the association between uh, graphemes and colors would be ad hoc, idiosyncratic. However, there's one study that suggests that probably it's not so random at all. After all, uh, you know, this uh, study we um, examined some people with synesthesia, and they found that the particular color used for letters in a Fisher Price uh, toy for kids actually had a lot of influence on how little color pairings were formed in the brains of these wonderful people. So, you know, it could be possible that synesthesia 
uh, is a, a result of um, automatic retrieval of highly specific mnemonic associations. So that is quite possible. And another issue about synesthesia is that uh, there are, there's this idea that more there are more females with synesthesia than males. And uh, this study uh, verified that and uh, tried to verify that. And th their conclusion was that while some studies reported uh, that uh, you know, up to six times more female synest synesthesia uh, uh, than male, but you know um, that could probably be due to a uh, recruit conf recruitment confound. And this study found no extreme female bias in synesthesia. I don't know. I mean, this is ongoing research, and it's really interesting. And synesthesia is a window into the really mysterious way that human uh, me memory system functions and this is quite interesting and there's this another study which used the flash suppression as a means to understand how uh, you know visual information is processed unconsciously and whether synesthesia would have some effect on that and the conclusion was that uh, there would be n no such significant uh, effect of uh, synesthesia on the unconscious processing of visual information so using the flash condition. So these really clever studies would shed light on the mechanism of synesthesia in the future. Now, there is this really interesting uh, question about the relationship between memory and creativity. Uh, some people say that there is a trade-off so that uh, people with great memory would not be so creative and vice versa, uh, you know, creative people and not necessarily people with great memory capacities. There is one interesting, um, you know, a case where the ability to memory memorize many things and the ability to create uh, coexisted within the man. That is uh, Amadeus Mozart, and you know, um, it is. In, this is a really famous uh, episode in which uh, Mozart. Uh, heard Gregorio Allergi's Miserere in the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican, uh, which was uh, totally out of bounds. I mean, it was not allowed to, you know, carry out, uh, be carried out, out of the Vatican. So it, this music could be heard only in the Vatican. But um, when Mozart was 14, he heard it once, and later he wrote the, you know, <laughs> score down. And after that, uh, he was out visited uh, the Sistine Chapel again, and you know he corrected a few mistakes in his score. That's how the this wonderful piece of music got out of Vatican, so it said. So, you know, Mozart had a really great memory capacity in addition to a great creative prowess. So that is, is I, I think, an interesting, unique um, example. Now, um, there are of course vulnerabilities of memory. And um, nowadays, with the advancement of uh, smartphones and computers and so on, uh, memory systems are more vulnerable than before. Uh, this wonderful book from Sweden, Anders Hansen, writes about the you know, um, effect of technologies on our brains. And this has been a huge bestseller. Uh, Japanese translation has been a best, huge bestseller here in Japan. And, you know, of course, there's this famous Google effect in which if you can Google something up, uh, you are less likely to uh, remember that. But which makes sense because uh, the, brain, the brain is, after all, an um, organ of adaptive strategy. And when we try to adapt to modern technologies, of course, we don't have to uh, re remember the details of information per se. Uh, we would be better advised to you know, uh, remember where the memories are. That's more, you know, of uh, what, what st strategy as, um, you know, in this uh, technically uh, advanced world. There's also this really interesting uh, case of false memories and force formed in the human brain. Uh, there is a famous case of Mantra effect in which Nelson Mandela uh, was falsely believed to be dead 
and people uh, believe that they Mansa Mandela died in prison, and they they believe that they have seen news footage of that. But that is not the case. So you know that uh, false memories could be experienced collectively within the population. And other famous examples are uh, that people, many people believe that C three PO from Star Wars was the complete god. Whereas actually one of his ex was silver, and also uh, in the queen in Snow White uh, is believed to say "mirror, mirror on the wall" by many people. Uh, whereas the correct phrase is "magic mirror on the wall." So there are all these, you know, really interesting cases of false memory, and as the scientific community has have studied um, you know, false memory through the DRM task program. This is a really clever paradigm in which words related to a non-represented world, such as sleep, are presented. So when this was done, the subject would make a false recall rate of up to 55%. So this is a powerful tool to cause an illusion of memory. And you know, so the DRM has been used in many studies, and in this particular study, they um, you know examined whether auditory uh, information or visual information uh, uh, more likely to um, cause false memory. And their conclusion was that um, auditory memory is more likely to cause um, false memory compared to the visual memory. Now, Albert Einstein famously said that the secret to, to creativity is knowing how to uh, hide your sources. So, you know, there's this really subtle question about uh, the deformation of memory, if you like, and creativity. So is there a connection between false memory and creativity? The answer seems to be yes. Um, in this uh, clever uh, study, uh, they checked whether creativity measures can be positively uh, created with false memory measures, and the answer was yes. So, you know, there was this positive uh, correlation between false memories and uh, divergent thinking, so which is a uh, representation of the creative process. So, so memory is really interesting. You know, you have such a fuss about remembering things, uh, you know, correctly as much as possible. But you know, in the world, real world, in the brain function, um, you know, corrective, uh, the correct memory are not necessarily adaptive. I mean, sometimes you can. Uh, have adaptable, adaptable adaptability uh, when you have false memory because that will lead to more creativity. This is quite interesting. Now, um, finally, the time, the brain as a time machine. Um, remembering the past is very much related to uh, predicting the future. Actually, that is the name of the game for the human brain. I mean, the human brain remembers things so that it, they could make uh, better predictions about the future which, of course, leads to um, adaptation. So this study uh, found nearly identical patterns of default mode network activity. When individuals were asked to imagine events that might occur in the future or might have occurred in the past. So imagining the future and imagining the past uh, activated the same, exactly the same neural circuits. And this ability to imagine the future on the strength of remembered past uh, declines in semantic dementia patients. So, you know, there's this really interesting connection between remembering the past and imagining the future, predicting the future. And which, so in this case, uh, in this sense, the brain is truly a time machine. Now, um, we remember the past, typically, <laughs> and we don't remember the future, typically although some people do claim to do that. So why is that? I, why is there such a temporal asymmetry uh, in memory capacity? So naturally, uh, you know, second rule of thermodynamics in which it states that entropy always increases um, for a closed system uh, would have something to do with it. And you know, for that, um, probably we would be well advised to remember the second order of third order IMX and Maxwell's demon. You know, Maxwell's demon is this thought experiment in which the demon would try to, you know, observe the movements of gas molecules and, you know, selectively opening up and, 
closing down the door between two chambers would lead to um, asymmetric distribution of hot and cold gases, so that that would lead to a reduction of entropy, which is a contradiction. So this contradiction um, emerges because we assume that there is no cost to what the demo is doing, uh, intellectually, information processing. And so this uh, interested many, many scientists to study the foundations of uh, information processing from thermodynamic uh, aspect and uh, John von Neumann did a wonderful job and uh, Rolf Landauer uh, came up with this idea of Landauer limit of uh, uh, you know minimum energy dissipation per a bit of information and Charles Bennett uh, did a really wonderful job <clears throat> in elucidating that it was the memory erasing process that was important. Uh, when I was a PhD student, I wrote a letter to Rolf Landauer, Landauer then at IBM Research in well, um, New, New, New York Town House. And he replied very kindly, so I remember him as a very deeply kind person, in addition to uh, brilliantly intelligent, so I really miss uh, Dr. Rolf Landauer. Now, uh, finally, I come to the last part of my lecture, uh, in which we discuss the enigmatic relation between time and memory. Uh, there are so-called five-minute hypothesis and Omphalos hypothesis, which is really interesting in terms of memory. But uh, now, Bertrand Russell is an intellectual that I really admire. His career was full of inspiration, and he was uh, the most, um, mentor of Ludwig Wittgenstein and uh, Russell did really wonderful jobs in uh, the foundations of mathematics and philosophy and theories of mind and so on. And of course, Russell is very famous for Russell's paradox. And you know, this is a really serious program for the formalization program of um, mathematics because when you formalize uh, natural numbers in terms of set theory, uh, you know, you can't escape making all these nonsensical uh, statements. So this is, um, from my point of view, a fundamental limit of the formalization uh, project of mathematics, but uh, more of that uh, maybe later in this lecture series. So uh, Barton Russell's hypothesis the hypothesis is that maybe we cannot distinguish, distinguish a world which existed from distant past and a world that was made five minutes ago, but with all the memories of the past implemented in it. So from you know philosophical point of view, uh, Barton Russell's argument makes sense. I mean, maybe we cannot uh, distinguish between a world which was made a long, long time ago and a world made five minutes ago uh, with all the memories in it. But intuitively, there is something amiss. And, you know, I suspect that something have has something to do with um, Arne Bergson's pure memory concept. So this is quite interesting. Um, specifically, I would be arguing that if you think about pure memory seriously, maybe we can refute the high five minute hypothesis. And the same goes for the Omphalos hypothesis. This was put forward by Philip Goss, who um, wrote two years before Darwin's On the Original Species. And, you know, probably uh, at the time, the fossil records were already known. And, you know, because at the time, uh, many people believed in uh, the Bible. Uh, there was this contradiction between what the Bible says and the you know, evidence of science, and uh, Gosse claimed that uh, it probably God created the universe with all these fossil records and so on, uh, so that it would be consistent. And, you know, Adam, who had presumably had no mother, uh, because Adam was created directly by God, had the navel, had a navel, and so Omphalos is a Greek uh, name for navel. So on Pharaoh's hypothesis is that probably God created uh, um, the world uh, with Adam and Eve and so on, but Adam had that you know trace of uh, of the past on purpose 
the navel. And so this is um, um, logically similar to the five minute hypothesis. But uh, I, as I said, I believe that we can refute this kind of argument if we think about Andy Bergson's pure memory concept seriously enough. Now, so this is the last slide. Uh, so we have been discussing memory. And, you know, the unique way is why can't we remember the future? And, you know, this, for me, I mean, you know, I don't know about this, but it, probably the physical law doesn't forbid having a memory about the future. Maybe the second law forbids, but then we need to be specific about it, how the second law of thermodynamics uh, prohibits us having a memory for the future. And related to that, um, how can there be a free will if everything is deterministic or, you know, um, would evolve under the constraints of quantum mechanics and so on. So, you know, the, clearly the idea of memory of the future and the free will are in contradiction. So maybe there's this uh, strong relationship between the temporal asymmetry of memory and free will. And what is memory anyway? These are the questions we would be coming back uh, in the you know, remaining of these uh, lectures. Um, so see you then. Bye now. Have a good time.